forest resources while also sustaining those resources into the long term. And so um, I started collaborating with them just on the basic ecology, the pollination ecology of this species to, to, to look at how important it was. Um, and I, but I started out as just doing behavioral ecology. I was watching honeybee dances and finding out where the bees were going um, and making maps of how they were utilizing the forest. Um, but that really led me into this um, whole other world of thinking the way that we think about natural ecosystems as opposed to just focusing on basic research. I became very interested in the links between human society and the, the human dependence on those resources. And so over the years, I've moved more towards um, thinking about conservation from an ecosystem services perspective. And that is the idea that society um, benefits in very tangible, financially quantifiable ways from functioning ecosystems or parts of functioning ecosystems like an agro, ad agro ecosystem. So that if we support those systems and support the health of those systems, we as a species benefit very greatly in, again, in financial, financial tangible ways. And we can, um, so uh, you know, now um, that concept has, has taken on different names it, you know, when it was sort of just restricted to more of an academic or <laughs> conservation nonprofit um, audience. It was called ecosystem services. Now we call it um, green infrastructure or nature-based solutions, natural capital. A lot of the corporates are thinking of this as natural capital. Those, there's, there's value there um, beyond um, the aesthetic and spiritual value. Um, and so that's what has led me to the topic of climate smart agriculture. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit, I'm just going to give you a basic <laughs> definition, although I think a lot of you know what climate smart ag is. Uh, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go through some terms and give you some, some of the basics. Um, I'm more of a generalist in this in this area, I have a background in biology, but I've come to now embrace that how do we fit the science with the policy and the economic and financial realities to make what we know as scientists work in an, in an actual implementation context. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the work I've been doing in San Diego, um, trying to scale up, trying to, trying to find ways with a multi-stakeholder coalition to scale up climate smart ag in our region. Um, and now, so why does, so the bottom line is, uh, why does climate smart ag, why is it important for us as we try to, you know, think about food security and how we're going to provide food um, over the next decades um, to a growing population is be, the reason that we care about climate smart ag is a we have climate change challenges of course but also because it is a way to keep farmers in business um, and so we're going to talk about that a bit um, just to go through some of the terminology um, you know there's a lot of different words and I think people you know we don't know when when to use one when to use the other and there's a you know th these are sort of overlapping terms but you know, organic agriculture, that has got a certification process now. And so usually when people say organic, they're talking about, a, you know, a farmer or a farm that has gone through a certification process that um, looks at the agroecological system as a whole. Now, if you don't have the certification, many people still practice that way, but they don't have the certification. Um, but it's a, it's a kind of known set of methods. Sustainable agriculture is more, um, there, it's, it's more of a suite of methods that consider the integration of people and planet and profit. So depending on context, you can you know, sort of put yourself under that umbrella of sustainable agriculture. So it's not quite as strict a term. Regenerative is focused, again, similar to, to organic, it's, it's a focus on restoring ecological health, including biodiversity and soil health. There's no fixed metric. Um, it's, uh, some people use it as a narrow focus on soil, some people use it more looking at an eco-region and saying how can we 
replicate the native system using agricultural plants, um, using um, uh, cultivated relatives of the wild plants. And so that's again, right now it's, it's um, a term that is used very broadly. And a third concept that sometimes falls under regenerative agriculture is regenerating communities, economic regeneration, cultural regeneration. Um, and so it's, you know, there, there's a lot that can be unpacked there. Climate Smart Ag is getting, a, is getting more narrow, um, focusing on the climate risks, not only for agriculture, but also um, for society as a whole. Um, and the goals are of, of Climate Smart Ag are to increase production, build climate resilience, and reduce greenhouse gases. Um, right now, again, no fixed metrics, but the focus is very much on climate challenges. Um, and then carbon farming, getting even more narrow, there's a focus on carbon sequestration in the soil and the vegetation. The metric is greenhouse gas reductions, but um, there are also many resilience leaks. So I'm actually, you know, right now we're at a point where I'm using these two kind of synonymously. Sometimes I talk about climate smart ag, sometimes um, strictly carbon farming, but they're, I'm using them um, interchangeably. So uh, this is just a little info infographic on the climate challenges in our region that we're facing and how they end up with a positive feedback loop um, when we start thinking about their impacts on agriculture. So um, we're gonna have longer, hotter summers, more extreme heat waves, um, increased risk of wildfire and um, changing precipitation patterns. Not necessarily a different average precipitation, but just less predictability in the system. And you know, when we, droughts might be more severe, more prolonged, and uh, rainfall will be more intense and um, spatially more variable. Um, so how does that impact agriculture? Not just the plants, but what happens to an agricultural ecosystem is, um, is really the question when we start thinking about implementation of programs. Um, heat, we're gonna have drought and diminishing water supply. Um, and as our urban populations grow, the demand in San Diego, we use water that is the same, the same supply as the urban. Urban and agriculture use the same supply of water. And so there's gonna be increasing demand for that for that water supply and a diminishing water supply, um, leading to plant stress and higher water costs. So those irrigation costs are already putting farmers out of business. That's just that's going to get worse. Um, you, you know, crop loss. So irrigation costs are going to increase. You get crop losses because of drought and plant stress changes and changing uh, viability of the crop types. And so that's another. Um, uh, financial burden on a farmer that has to change what they're doing and what they're growing. Um, and then, so therefore a decline in farming economy, which then has, is leading and will continue to lead to conversion of farmland. And what it gets converted to very often will be development, maybe another agricultural type, but even if it goes back to native habitat, there will be increased greenhouse gas emissions from that initial period, even if it goes back to native habitat. In the, in the initial period, you're gonna see increased emissions. So, you know, we're trying to decrease our emissions, but this positive feedback loop with agriculture, it's, you know, ends up increasing our emissions. And the same thing when we have changing precipitation patterns, greater risk of wildfire, um, which leads to loss of farmland and rangeland um, vegetation, and uh, loss and those fires lead to, thank you, yeah, okay. The fires lead to loss of the um, soil's ability to hold water, which then you get, you get um, increased runoff, which affects our urban areas. You get flood risk, you get mudslides, declining water quality, um, which then again leads back to this issue of conversion of farmland. It just becomes inviable. Conversion of farmland gives you increasing greenhouse gases, and that leads back to more of the same. Um, and 
the wildfire itself, you're getting an increase. The wildfire itself is producing spikes of, of emissions. So this is not you know, a pretty picture if you're a farmer, and the farmers are on the front line of this. And so the question is, can we break this cycle? Can we, you know, it's a positive feedback loop. Are there intervention points here to stop this runaway um, cycle from going on? So the bad news is that last year the IPCC reported that we must not exceed 1.5. Before it was 2.2 degrees centigrade. Last year they said uh, it's actually will be better off if we keep our um, our warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius um, in order to avoid catastrophic climate change. We are projected to reach this by 2030. So that gives us 10 years to bend the curve in emissions. 10 years is, you know, right around the corner. Um, but the good news is one of our most important solutions lies right beneath our feet, literally in the soil, right beneath our feet. Um, and we just have to find ways to rapidly scale up the way that we treat our soil and our farmlands and, and also our natural spaces. Um, so, you know, carbon right now has a bad rap. It's considered, you know, it, it is an atmospheric pollutant and a lot of the general public, when they hear carbon, they think that's a pollutant. It is, but it's also, as you all probably know, it's a substance that all of, all living things are made of. It's it's an you know it's the basis of all life. So how do we again? How do we take it from being a pollutant to being um, the source of nourishing living things? Where you know back where it belongs um, and back where we we need it. Um, and agriculture, a certain set of agricultural methods can help us can help us do that. And so climate smart agriculture or carbon farming is a set of methods that are well known to farmers all over the world. It's just that they've fallen out of favor um, in our industrialized, mechanized, <coughs> or industrialized agriculture um, that, that prioritizes economies of scale, but we lose a lot in that process. So these are not anything new. Farming and ranching practices that build soil carbon um, and that reduce erosion um, that turns that carbon pollution in the atmosphere into forms of carbon that build and nourish living things. So some of the practices that are that are known uh, that you know are well known are um, just using permanent crops or per perennial crops such as orchard trees, which we have a lot of in this region, um, trees, shrubs, and vines. Um, using compost on croplands or using mulch. Um, and in fact, there's some work that's been going on for the last 10 years, starting up in Marin County, putting compost on rangelands. And that is turning out to have a very, uh, very, very promising rates of carbon sequestration by which that compost catalyzes um, a process uh, that helps the plants to grow, pull more carbon out of the air, stick it down in the soil. And it's a high initial input in terms of, you know, the, the logistics and the, um, the cost of acquiring enough compost and spreading it on an uneven rangeland. But once you do that one time, we know that for at least a decade, it continues to sequester carbon. And then when they model that out over multiple decades, we're seeing that the models are showing the sequestration will continue for up to seven, so far at least 70 years. And so um, that's being looked at more as uh, a way to bring together some of our California policy that's not only around building healthy soils and reducing greenhouse gases, but also taking, uh, reducing our uh, landfill waste by uh, composting green waste, removing green waste from landfills so that we have less methane coming out of the landfills and more green waste that goes into compost. And if we can put it on the rangelands, you know, it's this like nicely closed loop solution where, you know, there, there are a lot of uh, interest in that and research on that. Um, riparian restoration is another important form of carbon farming um, with perennials or the use of perennials in any way to, to uh, windbreaks, hedgerows. Um, cover cropping is another important carbon farming practice. No-till farming or reduced tilling. Um, and then silvo pasturing, which is um, putting trees in a uh, grazing, a rangeland landscape. Um, 
So tackling climate change has two parts, of course. There's mitigation, that is reducing greenhouse gases, canceling out all the emissions that we have that we're emitting from all our other activities. Um, and then resilience, which is maintaining key processes, being able to bounce back um, when we do face these climate challenges like heat, like drought, like fire, like um, irregular uh, rainfall. And Climate Smart Ag can actually help us do both. Um, so let's first take the mit mitigation benefits of carbon farming. Are you, the, do you have much time? Are you checking my time? 14 minutes. Huh? You're at 14 minutes. Okay, so I have six minutes left. Okay. <laughs> Um, so let's look at mitigation benefits first. So how do carbon farming practices reduce levels of GHGs? For one thing, many of these activities, they simply reduce the footprint of a farmer because they reduce the need for fertilizer, which has a, a high greenhouse gas emissions footprint. They reduce the need for, heavy, for machinery that burns greenhouse gases. So that is, that is one way that it just reduces the initial footprint of a, a farm operation. The second way is that they actually help plants to grow, and those, those plants are sequestering carbon in their tissues. So they're locking carbon into the body of a plant. And so a tree um, that will be there for decades uh, has sequestered and stored more carbon than um, an annual small herb or um, a vegetable plant, for example. Um, and then finally, the, the more, the really promising piece of this is that they sequester carbon in the soil. Um, and it, I blocked out in forms such as, it says in forms such as humans, but there's, there's a lot of science that's um, kind of, it, this, the science of soils carbon sequestration is changing. And so I'm just blocking out the word humus because that's not necessarily, um, the parlance that is being promoted right now. But basically, carbon, um, a plant photosynthesizes, produces carbohydrates, adds some of that to its tissue, wood, leaves, seeds, root, roots, and then up to 40% of those carbohydrates um, get turned into liquid exudates that exude through the roots. And so it's this liquid carbohydrate that goes down and through the roots that feeds soil, fungi, and bacteria, and those things glom on to, they feed on that, and they glom together the inorganic particles of the soil um, and with their fungal hyphae, and they create these aggregates. So that's when you see, you know, you, you have an idea of like dark, rich soils that have got these, these, crumb, these crumbs, basically we call it the soil crumb, um, and that's got sort of a spongy texture and it holds water. And so, um, so this is kind of a schematic of that. The 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 plant helps. The, you know, the plant grows through photosynthesis. The roots start to grow. As the roots grow, they they form this rich soil that helps the plant to grow more because of that that soil biota is helping the plant to um, acquire nutrients. And so that helps the plant to grow more. Positive feedback loop, more, more leafy matter means more photosynthesis, which means more root exudate. And as the roots grow wider and deeper, you're getting um, soil carbon that it gets locked in and binds to inorganic soil particles at deeper and deeper strata in the soil. And so if you can, so plants with deep roots and that are perennial, you know, if you can lock the soil, the, the soil carbon down here deeper, it has less chance of getting re-released and so um, the soil can actually hold an enormous amount of carbon if we, if we treat it well and we um, make sure our practices are, we're not only getting that sequestration, but we're not re-releasing it. So our practices also have to think about erosion control. Um, um, so the final, schematic here is the resilience benefits of carbon farming. So that was mitigation. What are the resilience benefits? So basically the main, the main thing about all this action that goes on between the living and the non-living parts of the soil are that they bind together in these clumps 
and that increases the soil's ability to hold water. And with that, a whole suite of other things can happen. And so, you know, we start, in, if you're in an area where you have groundwater, that soil is, is better, gets better infiltration and you have better chance of getting natural recharge of the groundwater. Um, it, if you um, are planting riparian re restoration, you're not only sequestering in the trees, you're building the soil carbon, that reduces the runoff from the agricultural areas, which then gives you better water quality and also reduces um, stormwater flows downstream. So this is a way that we can think about the urban-rural continuum and how upstream uh, rural areas are, can actually benefit, or how downstream urban areas can actually benefit from, from carbon farming upstream in the watershed. And the same thing, with, it gives us a way to utilize some of that green waste. It gives us a way to utilize some of the manure that is produced in our um, uh, horse operations, for example, we have a lot of stables in, in San Diego County and that produces right now, there's a lot of uh, surface water um, pollution that, that originates through um, unmanaged manure. But that manure actually is gold. If we turn it into compost, we compost the farms and we get all these additional benefits. So if we scale, so this, you know, if all this is going on in one farm, Maybe you won't be able to measure the benefits just at one, one farm scale, but if we scale it up, that's the real value, that there's resilience potential for the region as a whole. And so the question that we're asking in San Diego is how can we get this partnership between the county, which has um, a climate action plan with legally mandated greenhouse gas reduction targets and also a need to build resilience to the climate changes that we're seeing and that we know we will continue to see. How do we build a partnership between the county and um, our agricultural community? Um, so that's really the vision that we're trying to develop there. And um, I think I will stop there. And I later, as we go to the panel, I can tell you more about what we've found and what we're, what we're hoping to do. Thank you. Thank you, um, Dr. Batra. Next, I'd like to introduce Andrew Blue, the co-founder of